Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipperer, the club's vice president of media and editorial, and Michelle's co-host here at the club. We hope you are staying safe and are well wherever you are, and we look forward to seeing you in person someday in the future at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. Until that happens, we are doing all of our programming online. This is the latest in nearly 300 online programs the club has produced in the past seven months. You can find all about our upcoming programs, as well as audio and video from our past events and how you can help support our program production at commonwealthclub.org. Now, if you're watching us live on YouTube, you can use the chat feature to post questions for our panelists, and we'll work some of them into our conversation here today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao. She's a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors and the producer and the host of The Michelle Miao Show. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club for providing a platform for us to have these important conversations. If you're joining us for the first time, the Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. Whew, it's been a roller coaster of a week, and I'm sure of it that you know we're all feeling it. Uh, I can only use my own words to describe what I'm feeling, and that is agonizing optimism. <laughs> you might be feeling the same way if you are hoping for a Joe Biden pres presidency. But while we wait for those final counts to happen, to come in, there have been some results in shaping up our legislative branch, at least, and state, excuse me, statewide elections. And uh, those results will be sure to impact the issues that we care about most, especially the LGBTQ community. So where do we go from here? Well, we have a panel of esteemed leaders of the LGBTQI community, and I am so deeply honored to have them all here with us. And so it, without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists today. We have Andrea Jenkins, who's a member of the Minneapolis City Council, who's also a writer, a performance artist, a transgender activist, and who has made history herself. Uh, we also have Kiara Johnson, who's a, the incoming executive director of the National LGBTQ Task Force and also is a the former executive director of URGE, and also Andy Mara, who's the executive director of the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, who's also a board member for Freedom for All Americans and Just Detention International. Welcome all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I guess, you know, a good place to start. Why don't we start with, with the good, you know, before we get into all of the, 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 the work that we need to be mindful of, that we need to do, um, and the things that we are excited about in terms of the election results. I mean, I think the Victory Fund just sent out a mass email stating that we've made history in electing a record number of LGBTQI folks, uh, I think over uh, 179. It was kind of hard to believe, but there is a rainbow wave. Um, not that that's the only thing that's making us excited about the election results this time around, but everyone, let's join in. We'll start with Andy. What are you excited about in terms of this election? Well, I think you just said there was a record number of LGBTQ plus uh, leaders that were elected to local and statewide office. And I think, you know, more specifically for, for TILDEF, we were really excited to see so many trans and non-binary uh, people uh, elected to office. And in places um, that I think that many of us would not expect. Of course, there was, you know, a win out in Vermont with Taylor Small. There was also a win in New Hampshire with Lisa Bunker. But also, I think if we take a, a closer look at how some of the races um, closed out, we saw wins in Oklahoma. And we also saw a win in Kansas and in Colorado with trans folks um, being elected to their state legislatures. And we know that when we have a seat at the table, that that's really how policy and law uh, changes um, for our communities for the better. So I think that one big takeaway is to see that uh, trans people really won uh, big last night. And uh, I'm really excited to see how they uh, step up into these new roles and make a difference in, in states that, quite frankly, um, could use their voices at the table. Kira. Hi, um, 
you know, with the rainbow wave, um, I mean, that's one one thing to be excited about. And then the diversity of that that wave, right? Like, I, I mean, I was going through like all of the people and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like an overwhelming list of people of color from across the country, right? Who identify and are out, right? As queer. And so that for me, you know, mashes up with there's a record number of women who ran for office, right? And the number of people of color across, right, um, sexual orientation and gender that, that were elected this year. I mean, there really is a diversity um, that is creeping into um, our halls, uh, our ele- you know, in, in our halls of Congress that um, make me really... Um, just really excited. I'm also a a native Georgian, right? Like, so I can't tell you like watching Georgia over the last couple of days, like I've seriously thought I was going to throw up or have a heart attack. (laughs) I was like, which, where are we going? And I haven't, if you're from Georgia, we haven't felt that in a long time. And so, you know, I kind of feel like I get to puff my chest out a little bit, right? Like the Bible Belt and the Rust Belt, we cannot continue to ignore and forsake them. There is some real power there and, and, and it's coming out and we're seeing the results of what happens when we really invest in, right, folks um, on the ground in those places. And so, you know, I know we're still waiting to see things and, and, it, and like I said, this kind of anticipation feels really exciting. And Council Member Andrea, I mean, you, like I said in, in the introduction, you made history yourself. And, and when you were elected, I think we were like, wow, you know, can we hold this wave? And then here we are uh, in 2020. And I, I couldn't imagine, you know, all of this happening at that time. Yeah, you know, um, well, let me just start out by saying I am, I, I, I haven't quite been able to really, um, get excited about um, Kamala Harris being on the ticket. But I mean, we are like three or four, what, six uh, electoral college votes away from having a black woman as the uh, vice president of the United States of America. Um, That that is like really blowing my mind. But the races that we do know about um, and, and the rainbow wave that you spoke about, what is really most exciting about this whole thing to me is the number of trans and gender nonconforming and um, non-binary and LGBT identified people who were re-elected this cycle. Um, you know, proving that, you know, that those, those were not flukes. Um, Brianna Titone, um, is elected to her second term. Um, Danica Rome, um, you know, elected to her, her second term. Um, you know, that, that really, uh, in, in my mind, uh, solidifies the wave as it were, um, and that people are ready for change. Um, the the sheer numbers are, as as Kiara mentioned, almost overwhelming. Um, non-binary um, people of color, you know, having um, two LGBT Congress people from the state of New York is from the city of New York is going to be really impactful um, on the national stage as we already have witnessed uh, the squad and the the kinds of impacts that they have had on the national dialogue thus far. So and and it's 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 really exciting and you and you couple that with the potential of an administration that has been vocally um, um, and legislatively, in, in, in fact, um, impactful for transgender and gender nonconforming Americans in the, the Biden-Harris uh, ticket, you know, if, if that um, continues on the path that it is, and we have all of these um, 
community members um, represented in, in these offices, both federally and, and statewide, I, I think we're going to see some um, really exciting things for the LGBT and, and particularly transgender community within the next um, uh, four years. We're talking about, of course, the record number of LGBTQ victors in this in this most recent election, but there also was a record number of people, LGBTQ folks, who even ran. I think it was more than 500, something, almost 600. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what each of you think. Is this a reflection of better systems of recruiting and supporting LGBTQ candidates, or does it shift, or is there, you know, is there, or is just the political environment shifted more where they feel more comfortable running? I mean, how are we getting this great outpouring of more candidates? Well, I, I will speak as um, as a co-founding member of the Trans United Fund, um, as a um, as a participant in the Victory Fund. Um, you know, I would I would say, and and other um, many other election pre- preparation groups that have really reached out to LGBT candidates, I, I think that has had a significant impact on people's um, uh, ability to run for office, um, their awareness. You know, um, you know, I would have to say that, you know, the campaigns of, of myself and my colleague on the Minneapolis City Council, Philippe Cunningham, as well as Danica and, and so many others who have um, ran and won their races in, in past um, years have really inspired people to um, run for office. And, um, you know, but that coupled with the landscape is shifting. Um, you know, the, the awareness of people wanting to um, not only uh, have a seat at the table, but have a voice in those decisions being made um, is is palpable. I, I I think we have to credit the Black Lives Matters movement for really incorporating um, the idea that you know yes we must protest, but yes we must also be in the halls of power, and have really created this narrative that. If we want to see real change, we have to be involved in these systems to to bring that change about. Great. Uh, Kira, what do you think? I, I think Andrea said it all. I mean, I, I think it is a re- we are we are seeing um, the not so usual suspects starting to invest in um, preparing and running their own candidates. Right. Like we you know. For so long, I think folks depended on the parties, right? Um, and it became really clear that if if we're going to have more people who are reflective, right, of who we are, both in identity and also politics, then we got to do our own work. And so, like Andrea said, you know, you see Black Lives Matter, hey guys, running, um, running um, elections um, and and running candidates. Um, You're seeing more um, grassroots efforts, right? Like training and preparing trans and gender nonconforming people. And I think those underground efforts are also pushing the party or pushing the longer standing organizations like Emily's List, right? Like Emily's List is investing much more over the last 10 years in in women of color than they ever have before, right? And so I think we're seeing, right, um, new candidates from the grassroots and new efforts, but it's also, it's filtering up, it's trickling up and we're seeing more investment from these other groups as well. And Andy. I I think what Karen and Andrea said are are exactly right. And I think a good example is actually in my neck of the woods here in New York. Richie Torres um, was a former council member here in New York and is now uh, a member of Congress. And I think that that is a reflection of a pipeline of leadership that our movement is investing in. Um, I, I, I would also say, too, that, you know, in looking at um, party politics. Uh, there have been a number of folks over the years that have been working behind the scenes to improve uh, representation across the board. I think of, you know, 
Marissa Richmond, a longtime trans activist down in Tennessee who has been one of many activists in the Democratic Party pushing the party to be more inclusive and better. And I think that um, the same surprisingly can be even said um, about the Republican Party, though I think that, you know, those examples are a little bit few and far between to, to point to, but that work is happening. Um, and that isn't that isn't a coincidence, that's not a mistake. Um, there has been an effort by the broader LGBTQ plus movement to make sure that um, our community, our broad community um, is represented. And we are also creating a pipeline um, of leadership that can enter into other seats um, in their careers. And hopefully, you know, with, with with Danica Rome down in Virginia, as well as, um, you know, Sarah McBride in Delaware, these are people that are going to have seats at the table for years to come. And I'm very curious to see how their, how their uh, careers continue to develop. If you're joining us live, we welcome your comments and your questions for our panel. So send them in. We will try to get them to, to them and get them answered. Um, so talking about, you know, yes, the record number of folks from our community who've been elected and not just this election, but even, you know, in the midterms, I do think that there's been an impact in terms of at least effort to, to fend off some of the rollbacks or some of the attacks that our community has, uh, I would say, suffered, you know, from, from the last four years in terms of this administration, um, this administration began, you know, with a, a direct attack to the transgender community. And, uh, you know, some folks joke, I think it was just a tweet maybe from the toilet seat that the president made in terms of announcing that he would ban transgender service members from serving. And then, you know, an avalanche of other policies. Uh, that was a really long winded way of just kind of taking us back to the beginning. And, uh, you know, when we asked where, where do we go from here? Do we want to take maybe a minute from each of you to talk about, you know, some of the, some of the rollbacks, some of the anti-LGBTQ policies, and and just to give everybody context of, uh, you know, what's to come, um, and and that's just foreshadow of some other things we'll bring up, such as the Supreme Court and a potential uh, Republican-controlled Senate. Uh, we'll begin with Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um... You know, before I begin my answer, I do want to just acknowledge that I am a proud board member of uh, Tell Death, um, the Transgender Legal Defense Fund. And, um, you know, we have been very actively fighting off attacks um, from the far right, um, from this administration, um, you know, the Supreme Court. Um, but I will say that that we've been able to um, have have some victories along the way as as well. Um, but the 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 attacks have have really um, created um, uh, a deep sense of um, um, fear and 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 loathing within the the trans community. Uh, specifically, and and I think even the the LGBT community more broadly. I hope anyway, but um, but we have absolutely seen the broader LGBT community really um, uh, stepping forward to be more vocal and more inclusive and more uh, supportive of um, the trans community as it relates to the broader LGBT community. Um, I, I really look forward to uh, a Biden-Harris administration reversing uh, many of those um, um, attacks and, and policy shifts that have um, conspired to um, oppress the trans and gender nonconforming community. Um, and, you know, but I, I will say, regardless of what administration prevails, I, I think the fights are going to continue. Um, the, the, the advocacy is going to continue. Um, we, we are, um, I, I, I guess I can speak for myself. I am committed to um, continuously 
uh, standing up for the rights of trans and gender non-conforming people and, and, and beyond um, as a human right. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm thinking. Kiera, just reviewing the, the damage, the dam how much damage has been done. Um, you know, this is one of the places, you know, you met, you said on the, in the beginning of the, the show, like the place I don't like to dwell, um, I get into a really, um, depressed place when I think about all the damage caused. And, and I think, um, you know, the reality is, is that this, you know, Pandora's box has been opened, right. Um, our democracy, right, and all of the, the 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 brokenness of it has been exposed. I'm not saying it just happened in the last four years, but it has been exposed. And there are some new breaks too. Um, the racism, the fear, the xenophobia, the the homophobia, like it's it's palpable right and it's been and it's been right unleashed right with with the highest you know you know from the highest office in the land um and that can't just be stuffed back into the box right um you know i've already seen some of the reports that you know trump had even higher support from some folks than last time around from, a lot of us are like how is that even possible? And it it it's it, it's an illustration of what's always again what's always been there, right? And and that's on one hand, um, it's scary, right? And it's daunting. And on the other hand, you know, in some ways, I feel vindicated, right? Like how many times as people of color have we been saying we are not a post racial United States? It doesn't matter that Obama became president. Yeah, I know you think it's just that small group over there, but it is deep and it's in our institutions. It's in the air that we breathe, right? Like, and we sound like conspiracy theorists, right? Like for, for so long, we sounded like conspiracy theorists. And then in 2016, we were like, see, we told you, <laughs> you know? So in some ways, right, it's like AA, you've got to admit you have a problem before you can start recovery, right? And we've got a race problem. We've got a, a lot of um, ism problems in this country that, we, that we've got to address. And so I, I do, I agree with Andrea in that, you know, a Biden-Harris ticket is one way forward. Um, and, you know, the reality is, is that it's undeniable, like how, how many people are in it to win it in terms of working on social justice issues, right? Like even in the last four years, like the experiments that our people are doing, right? Like instead of, you know, calling the police in California, I think it's in Northern California where they created a whole new entity where you, you it's, it's um, mental health providers for homeless people, right? Like it seems so little, but that small change is so big. And I think there's no time like now. I think we've got to stop acting like we can just, you know, just trust that this democracy and the way we've been doing things is going to work for us. And I think we got to experiment and invest money and time in, um, in trying some new, uh, into, in some new strategies. And Andy, your thoughts? I have a lot, um, but let's start. Let's start with the fact that we're still here and standing. We're still here doing the work, and we have survived three years, three plus years of turmoil. And we've also seen some wins. It's not just about surviving. We've also been able to find pathways to victory. Andrea mentioned um, earlier that um, there have been some successes. Um, despite the the really hostile climate that many of us um, have have been forced to navigate, um, and I, I think a good example is the Supreme Court, um, and, and I know that's something we're going to talk a little bit more about. But let's start just start with the fact that you know in June, the Supreme Court, which arguably had a, a significant, it still has a significant conservative presence on the bench, um, in a six three decision, they ruled that. LGBTQ plus employment discrimination uh, is against the law and that uh, LGBTQ workers across the country are protected under federal law, six to three. And Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion. 
And I think even more interesting was Justice Alito's dissent, um, where he essentially outlined um, our path to victory um, in, in, in mapping out how we get to uh, not only uh, trans-inclusive protections across the board, but LGBTQ plus protections across the board. And there is litigation um, across the country in, in state, uh, state and federal courts where we are winning. Um, and we intend to win because the law is on our side. Now, do I think that litigation is the end all be all? No, and I run a legal advocacy organization. It is a multi-pronged effort and our, mo our movement has done an incredible job at building an infrastructure where we're able to be in the fight in a number of arenas. Um, I think right now in the moment that we're in as we wait for the outcome of the election, um, win, lose or draw, no matter what side um, you come down on, we need to invest further in democracy building work, specifically within the LGBTQ plus movement. Um, we have the numbers on our side and it's time for us to mobilize and coordinate in a bigger way than we have ever done before. And on issues that I think we have been, for many of us who have been in the movement for so long have been wanting to talk about the intersections between uh, racism, sexism, uh, transphobia, xenophobia, and how they apply to you know everything from immigration to criminal justice to education um, to even talking about housing and healthcare. Uh, we have the numbers, we have the expertise, and now it's time um, for our movements to to get to work. This is the this is the time to get to work. Um, not to end on a sour note, but. You know, I think for us, as we, you know, as the dust settles, we're going to have to figure out um, what that mobilization looks like. And I think one of the questions that we need to grapple with as a movement is support. Um, my biggest fear is that even with a Biden-Harris win, um, our supporters are going to walk away. And the work is not done. The work is just beginning. Um, and our opponents, who are just as committed to advancing their agenda uh, and agendas are well-resourced with budgets in the tens of millions of dollars. And so we, as a part of our democracy building work, have to not only engage community members um, and our neighbors and our friends and, and other like-minded activists across the spectrum of social justice, but we also have to engage our donors in being a part of the effort as well. I just want to take us back maybe 40 hours uh, to uh, Tuesday night when people started watching, uh, you know, races and following, switching between MSNBC and, and where all whatever sources we were following. Um, each of you kind of like, what races were you following and what surprises did you see? Whether they were good surprises or of course bad surprises. Obviously, um, <laughs> we're all still going through churning through uh, these these things, and we're still glued to uh, these news sources. Uh, I think Jimmy Kimmel said this is like you know being awake during your own surgery, just kind of watching this stuff slowly happen. Um, but maybe starting with you again, Andy. Uh, you know, what, what were you watching Tuesday night, and 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 you know what gave you the good feelings, and what what maybe uh, bothered you about? It? Well, I think like everyone, I was incredibly excited about the numbers and. Let's just start there. We've, we've never seen the kinds of numbers in terms of voter turnout in, a, in almost a century, a century. Um, and so that was exciting to see, you know, it's been, it's been annoying, of course, to wait and for the batches of ballots to come in. But I think that is, a, on the flip side, that's really exciting to know that our democracy is at work. And we, as a movement, a larger progressive movement, have done an extraordinary job at mobilizing people to, to use their right as a, as a, as a, as a, as a citizen to vote. Um, so I was really excited about that. Um, I think something that we don't talk about, um, and certainly I think our movement should, is you know, the fact that there are a couple of states that legalize marijuana. And I bring that up only because 
Um, that means that there is an opportunity for us to talk about what about the folks that were convicted with possession, right? And of course, in talking about that, we know that the vast majority of those, those folks are black and brown folks. And we also know that for, for folks that have um, in fact possessed marijuana, it's, it's been a form of survival, survival work. It's the underground economy. And so that this is, it's been exciting to see how there has been a momentum of states that are actually passing progressive policies or enacting progressive policies where we actually have an opportunity for as, 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 as varied movements to start to chip away at the inequities attached to them. Very good. Kira, how was your Tuesday night and what were you watching most? Oh gosh. Um, I had fried chicken and matzo ball soup. That tells you a lot about where my state of mind was. I was like, I need all the comfort foods. I'm not even playing. Um, <laughs> I was going between MSNBC and CNN and then watching Twitter, right? And then I was on a Zoom call with my staff. Like, so I had all four of these things, had like two things in my ear and then my eyes on two different things. Um, and I agree with Andy, like the numbers alone, they, it was... It, it just blew my mind. And, and I, what I kept thinking is, I hope this isn't a one-off, right? Like, I hope this is a, like, I hope we are, we are taking the learning from this and we shift how we're doing elections, right? As we move forward. I, 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 I really hope that is the case. So I kept thinking a lot about that. And like I said, and I'm, I am a, a deep, rooted Georgian. So I was watching all of the like Bible Belt, right? Like rest, like I was like, Texas. Come on, Texas. Come on, Texas. Looking at Texas. I was looking at Georgia. I was like, I know Florida don't, people don't think of Florida as the South, but it is homies. Um, I, you know, I was looking at, I was watching Florida and the Carolinas. Like I was just deeply invested in what I call my people. Right. Like I'm like the Southerners, we got to show, we got to, we got to show up and show out. Um, and then of course, Pennsylvania, that was an outlier, <laughs> but it's just over the Mason Dixon line. So, you know, I kind of claim them too. Um, so, you know, I, I, I just had this, um, I was just eager to see, right. Like what our organizing efforts were looking like. And if, you know, if, if we were going to really be able to, to shift these States and, and it kept, and I, I was watching it unfold and I was like, we are. Like regardless of what happened, like what it happens in the end, it was so clear that we had made a huge dent. Like I wanted to like run out and hug Stacey Abrams, right? Like you're going to mention her, yes. Yeah, like there's no way we would see what's happening in Georgia without like her. Um, and so that's um, that's that's really what I was paying attention to. Like what you know, it was like being on a roller coaster. I was like, come on, and I was like, oh my god, and I'd be like, oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Council member Jenkins. Yeah, I was, you know, I mean, pretty much like my other two esteemed panelists, you know, um, my stomach was in knots. Um, I actually went and, and watched um, with my mother uh, who lives just blocks from me. And, you know, for a little context, um, everybody, I, I, I live two blocks from George Floyd Square. Um, I, I represent the area in which George Floyd was murdered. Um, so I was really paying attention to local races. Um, you know, um, Minnesota was on the verge of being a battleground state. Um, and so, you know, um, I, I think the, the, the Trump campaign visited here like 20 times in the last um, three months. You probably heard about some of the coronavirus cases that people uh, contracted at Trump rallies here in Minnesota. Um, and even that didn't really depress the turnout of, um, of his supporters. Um, and yeah, those same 53% of all white women who showed up in 2016 pretty much showed up again 
in um, 2020, um, which is deeply depressing. But, um, you know, I was, I was paying attention to, to the local races um, and, um, you know, certainly looking at those battleground states like, you know, uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan and our neighboring state, Wisconsin, which um, finally <laughs> did the right thing. And I mean, they try every single tactic of voter suppression. And I, I think there was like only one polling location for the entire city of Milwaukee. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I mean, but people stood in line, people mailed their ballots, you know, um, and, and it gets cold in Minnesota and Wisconsin, you guys. So uh, <laughs> even though we had the absolute most perfect uh, election day weather, 75 degrees in Minneapolis, and um, um, I think Wisconsin was pretty warm too. But um, yeah, it was a very tense night. It seems like it was four months ago already. Um, but, um, you know, we, we are um, anxiously awaiting the, the final results. Um, I do think it's probably going to be a pro protracted um, cycle with all of the frivolous lawsuits that are being uh, brought forward. Uh, but I am happy that democracy will prevail. And, you know, I was reading, um, I saw a tweet on um, uh, Twitter <laughs> this morning, social media, I guess. But, you know, um, in every, in all of these battleground states, right? Atlanta, Philadelphia, um, Milwaukee, um, you know, the black vote is what um, is going to eventually bring this election home. And, um, I, I, you know, for as I, I'm in the middle of reading Cast, I don't know if people are familiar with this book by Isabel Wilkerson, um, but it talks about the, the cast system in the United States, the, um, um, how, how, as Kiera so eloquently stated, how um, racism is, is embedded in the architecture of our society um, and has been since its inception. Um, and, you know, regardless of how much this society has tried to and continues to try and oppress, depress, suppress the black and brown and native communities in this country. Yet we still come to the rescue of democracy each and every time. Um, and, and I just, you know, think that is um, incredible to note. Um, and, you know, maybe at some point in the history of this country, um, the broader population will recognize these contributions. But if they don't, guess what? Um, these young people are out in the streets. They land in the freeways. They protesting in front of corporate offices. Um, all of these institutions and they're saying you can't continue to ignore us. We are here and we are gonna stay here until justice is served. Don, I just, I don't mean to just insert myself, but that deserves an exclamation point with what Andrea just said. And I think, you know, as exit polling becomes more available, I think we are going to see outright that the reason there was such a massive voter turnout was predominantly because of black, Latinx, indigenous and other folks of color across the country. And I think, you know, in looking at how some of the states are playing right out right now, you know, Arizona and Nevada, there are demographic shifts that are happening and we're seeing not just folks organize in those, in those communities, but we're also seeing folks show up at the polls. 
And I think even, you know, whatever happens in the South, in North Carolina, in Georgia, the reason these, these races are so tight is because of activists who've been doing this work for a very long time and they deserve all of the praise for making this race so tight and for turning bodies out to vote. Thank you so much for that, Andy. And that, that is exactly where I wanted to pick up. And I think, you know, part of it was selfishly, like I needed to hear from, you know, the incredible activists and advocates and the longtime folks who've been doing this work as we sit on pins and needles, Andy, as you'd mentioned before the program started. Um, and where I'm going with that is that, you know, there, there is a, a narrative that kind of plays out people's fears right now. And there's a case that the Supreme Court um, just began to heard, or I'm sorry, just began to hear, <laughs> reading my notes. Uh, and that's, that's Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia, in which a, an agency, the Catholic Social Services, sued the city of Philadelphia in wanting to exercise, according to them, a constitutional right to turn away LGBTQ people or people of different faiths if they wanted to for religious reasons. And, you know, the, the, the point there is that an agency that takes taxpayers' money, are they even able to do this? Now, whatever happens, whatever decision uh, comes out of that is going to impact you know, LGBTQ people and people of different faiths and how organizations and businesses are able to, in my opinion, at least discriminate um, that is a, a case that, uh, as an LGBTQ voter, I'm worried about. I'm worried about uh, Affordable Care Act. We know that you know the, this administration wanted to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, which, uh, as we know, you know provides lots of lots of coverage, protection, access to health care for LGBTQ folks, especially folks with pre-existing conditions. I bring this up just to ask you a simple question on, you know, what are the issues that we are a little worried about? And the reasons why you know, the resiliency of our community is what is going to make a difference, regardless of who becomes president of the United States. Um, and so we'll begin with Andy. We'll pick up from you. Any 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 issues that you're you might have been in the back of your mind worried about? I think you mentioned one of them. Um, the lawsuit that you know. <laughs> The day after the election, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments for Fulton Z, uh, v. City of Philadelphia, and as you said, this is this is a lawsuit to deter that will determine whether or not uh, agencies, particularly you know social welfare providers um, who who hold religious beliefs as part of their agency, um, and voluntarily accept taxpayer money, um, can they uh, discriminate? against LGBTQ people, uh, uh, people of different faiths, or even unmarried folks. And uh, it's, a, it's a serious concern because even though this, this case centers on the, uh, a foster care agency, um, this has deep implications or far reaching implications. This goes beyond LGBTQ plus adoption. This is about whether or not a food homeless shelter or even a hospital can turn away people um, because of their, of their religious beliefs. And I think what's unfortunate about how this narrative is, you know, optically has played out is that we're somehow pitting freedom of religion against, you know, LGBTQ rights. And I don't think that they're in conflict with each other. What is that? What is at stake is whether or not an agency that receives government money, once they sign that contract, are able to break the terms um, based off of what, you know, in this instance, the facility of Philadelphia, they have a non LGBTQ plus non-discrimination ordinance, and the agency bulked at that, which prompted this lawsuit. And, you know, zooming out and looking more specifically at, at the community that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, trans people, largely live on $1,000 a month, um, have to turn to, you know, survival, survival economics in order to survive, not just pay their bills, but to survive. And 
there are many people in the trans community, many people that I personally know, and I'm sure that Andrea and Kiara can also, you know, as I'm saying this, they they know of some of these people as well in their own in their own circles that do rely on food pantries, that do rely on emergency shelters or emergency housing, and do re rely on community health centers or or clinics or even hospitals for life saving services. So. We're watching this case very closely, Tilda. Um, we signed an amicus brief um, opposing, obviously, um, the argument to, dis uh, to discriminate against um, not just LGBTQ plus people, but uh, people of different faiths and um, unmarried folks. But if that weren't enough, next week, November 10th, the Supreme Court is going to hear all our arguments for California v. Texas. And that is whether or not, to determine whether or not uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, should be struck down. Uh, and this is what the current administration has been gunning for, for years. And so they have this lawsuit that's going in front of the Supreme Court. And why this is an LGBTQ plus issue um, is because of the fact that the ACA has provided coverage, health healthcare coverage for so many in our community. This isn't just about state exchanges and about buying your insurance off of state exchange. This is about the expansion of Medicaid. And many of our folks in our community rely on Medicaid for their health care. Uh, and many of, and add on top of that, uh, the ACA includes something known as Section 5057. It includes a non-discrimination provision that allows for LGBTQ people, uh, LGBTQ plus people to be able to access health care regardless of your sexual orientation or gender identity. If the ACA goes, that means not only are we uh, not protected, um, in terms of being able to access healthcare, we just won't have access to healthcare. Um, and I think what's ironic about this, this lawsuit is that it's happening in the midst of a global pandemic. And if you have contracted COVID, and many of our, and many I think in our community are just as susceptible as everyone you know in this country, if you have contracted COVID, that's a pre-existing condition. And you won't be able necessarily to have access to healthcare or be covered because of that pre-existing condition. So we have a lot at stake right now. Um, and I think, you know, in our movement, whether it's LGBTQ plus movement or the healthcare access movement and beyond, we're, we're watching these lawsuits very closely. Kira, some, some issues that are worrying you or on in the back of your mind. Um, all, all of that. Um, and it's so funny, Andy, you were like, I don't want to be a downer. I'm like, it's hard to not be a downer right now. I mean, I, there's great stuff and there's just some really heavy stuff. Um, and you know, rebuilding our democracy, I think is the, like it is at the fore, it's at the forefront for me. And, and, and it, it takes in account a whole bunch of things, right? So I've, I've been thinking a lot about um, how do we expand uh, and invest in campaigns that are working on um, uh, restoring voting rights for returning citizens, right? Like, you know, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir and probably folks have heard this, but like for, you know, over 40% of women sitting in prison identify as lesbian, bi, queer, right? Like that's not a solidarity issue. That's us. We're, we don't, we're not getting to vote. Right. And, um, you know, redistricting, right. Like judges, I know judges are like the least sexy thing for an activist to work on, but <laughs> You know, I'm like, how do we make working on judges sexy again? And we ma we managed to make the census sexy. So I feel like we got a secret sauce. So maybe we can figure out how to make, um, you know, prioritizing, um, getting our people right into these pipelines and supporting them. Right. Is um, is critical. Um Federal protections for LGBTQ people like we're literally. Um, I Someone asked me the other day, like, how did we get marriage and we don't have federal protections yet? And I was like, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you any law stuff around that. And it's actually not surprising, right? Like, you know, if you look back through history, civil rights are the hardest fought and won, right? Women, 
black folks, immigrants, right? Like it is, it is literally people are losing their lives. They're going to prison. They're putting their bodies on the line for civil rights, right? And human rights. And so it's not, it actually doesn't not make sense. We're, you know, that's what our people are having to do. We're putting our bodies on the line. Um, and, um, and we're watching them getting picked away. Right. And, um, uh, and I'm going to stop there and mute myself. Council member Jenkins, any, any issues back of your mind and, uh, any ones that you're worried about? Well, certainly there are issues, but first I, I just got to say how, um, how deeply dismayed and, um, um, disappointed I am with the disingenuousness of quote religious organizations that go to court to be able to hate people like that is the absolute most egregious thing that I can ever imagine people who have built up centuries of dogma and institutions and buildings that are supposedly related to the fact that we should all love each other. And yet we want to deny people basic needs, health care, um, shelter, food. That is unconscionable to me. And I hope this session is being recorded and that um, this. Yeah, I, I, I how we have a constitution that supposedly separates um, the church and the state, and yet the church is driving every single issue in of importance in our country is absolutely unconscionable to me. Um, you know, yes, the the everything that Andy and and Kiera talked about. Uh, particularly, um, you know, I, I've been working on um, the, the Equal Rights uh, Amendment for um, employment and housing for LGBT people for 30 years. Um, and, and we have to pass that um, now. The Equality Act must become law. Uh, it needs to be passed by the Congress, um, and um, and and I think that's where we're going to have to really put our pressure on on because these these court decisions um, and executive orders they don't stand. We we have to put these things into law, um, and we need our um, legislators to be able to do that. Um, you know, Andy, you, you said maybe we might know this past Thursday, one week ago, I was at a vigil for two um, trans women who overdosed. The vigil, they were living in um, uh, a shelter for women who queer, lesbian, uh, trans women who have either just been released from prison, to your point, uh, Kiara, and or experiencing homelessness or chemical dependency issues. And they both overdose because of the um, uh, undaunting, undaunting oppression from um, society that says you don't matter, you, you can't live here, you can't get services here, um, you, you can't have access to food. And, and consequently, they were just living in a state of um, uh, a heroin sort of uh, haze. And, and, and unfortunately, um, they both overdosed at ages of 27 and 28 years old. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, this, this, uh, shelter is being run by the Catholic church, 
So um, there is some um, humanity in in some of these um, quote religious institutions, um, but um, yeah, that that is very disappointing um, and maddening and frustrating, and um, it it has to change. It has to change, and I'm going to borrow what you said in the beginning there. This is being recorded, but I'm going to borrow what you said there and make it into a tweet, council member, so that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to quote you. Um, you. I'm going to toss it to John. We've got a, just a few minutes left. Uh, John. Well, on our YouTube channel, there's uh, some discussion by our viewers regarding the allure of racism for millions of voters in this election, of course, and others. Um, and in addition to that, I would like to bring in, bring up the gender gap for both parties. You know, the, the Democrats uh, strongly winning uh, female voters, the Republicans now strongly winning male voters. And, and that has played, you know, in some of the breakdowns they've shown us over the past couple days, you know, that's played a role in some of the various districts and things. Um, and I assume that's going to continue to be a significant political factor for years, won't it? Um, any thoughts on that? And if so, is there is that something to be addressed, or is that something of okay, that's a shake out of the 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 can't the the two parties that maybe that you know maybe with more homogenous parties that allows the parties to get more done or something like that. I mean, I think the again, right? It's one of those like I have two. I'm a Gemini. I have two minds about it, right? It's like on one hand, right? Like there's a part of me that feels vindicated, right? Like there are women who are winning, right? In, 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 uh, you know, in multiple parties, right? So in the Republican party, we are seeing that conservative voters want women to vote for too, (laughs) right? And it also punctuates the sexism and misogyny that has kept them out, right? Like it's, it also, like, you can't have one without the other. That becomes, uh, you know, uh, illustrated through that. And then on the other hand, I'm like, you know what? Well, we have to remind people that representation, while important, isn't enough. Like, not all women represent me, right? Like, not all Black folks represent me, right? And and representation is important, but the other piece of, of, of civic participation is not just getting people elected, but it's holding them accountable, right? And so the importance, right? Like, I know election day and election season is critical and the real hard work is the accountability and holding people to task, right? And platforms and making sure they hear from all of their constituents is, is, is it's paramount, right? Like we, we've got to make sure that these folks are not just pictures on a website, right? But they're actually, <laughs> that we're actually holding them accountable to the communities who they represent, whether we voted them in or not. Uh, I can tell you on a local level, that is a very real thing that happens every day, or at least in Minneapolis. Uh, I have been involved in politics as a policy aide for the past 18 years, and I have never seen so much um, uh, engagement and involvement with with local government uh, as I have witnessed in these past three years as an elected official um, on on almost every issue, particularly around the budget, which is really uh, a critical piece for people to get engaged in. Um, And, um, you know, um, as you all know that the whole conversation around defunding the police sort of got lit right here in Minneapolis and, um, and, and, you know, I will be very frank. Um, that idea did not originate from my colleagues. That idea was pushed forward from um, people uh, going beyond just the picture on the website and saying, hey, you guys, um, we, we got to make some changes. We got to do something different here. Uh, and so that that holding your elected officials accountable 
after election day is a very real and necessary uh, thing. And, and it works. It, it moves the conversation. Um, and um, it's, it's really important. Uh, well, the only thing I'll add to that is, you know, I think <laughs> we need to do a better job as a movement of becoming a little bit more sophisticated. And I'm not talking about LGBTQ plus people. I'm talking about writ large. This, we need to zoom out and take a peek at, at why this race is so close. And, you know, for me, it, it, there are a couple of immediate thoughts that I have is obviously one, um, this just confirms what so many black indigenous and folks of color already know that white supremacy is a real thing in this country. Um, and we're now, I think as a country collectively just seeing it on a map, um, but it's a thing. But what I, what I think is also important to, to name too is the fact that we are being used, folks of color are being used um, to obviously fan the flames of white supremacy. And, you know, at the same time, for a lot of my values, a lot of my beliefs, um, we're also see, you know, we're also seeing the fact that folks in these states are voting against themselves. And a lot of it has to do with, I'm just gonna say economic despair. And, and this speaks precisely to the reason why I think the work that has been done for years and is now becoming more mainstream, this idea or notion of intersectionality is important. Race and class and gender, those things matter. And when they're compounded together, whether it's as an individual and in an, in an identity or as a, as a political issue, we're, we're seeing this play out. And so we need, this country needs to do a better job, not just with its issues related to race, racism, but we also need to do a better job in speaking to Andrew's point around holding our electeds accountable when it comes to economic equity, like in class equity. And I don't have the, the magic solution for that, but what we're seeing play out is exactly what our movements have been talking about for years. And so here we are, and now we need to get to work and find that solution. So that way we can de-escalate, not just the despair, but also the rage that we're seeing play out across the map. And those are some great words and advice to end our program. I uh, can't believe we filled up the hour, but here we are. Where do we go from here? Get to work. We have so much work to do. And thank goodness that we've got all these great, incredible heroes, heroes, uh, you know, who are part of our community who are, have been doing the work and are doing the work. Thank you, Andy, Kara, council member Jenkins for joining us for this program. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this program. And John, I'll leave it to you for the last words. Um, and thanks for all the kids who joined us. We, we were expanding our audience. I love that. Um, thank you everyone for watching us. This program will be on our YouTube channel and uh, it'll also be airing on uh, our audio network. So you can find this as well as future programs at commonwealthclub.org. Wherever you are, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you in the future.